Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to the Adventures Travel Club television show. Betty, we find ourselves in a very exciting place this time. Don't yeah, we? but I like the way you started it when we were first talking to ourselves. What did you say? Something oh, about... Oh, it says, welcome to the Temple of Karnak. Yeah, that sounds better. Let's, 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 let's like do that? it that way. Sure, okay. because that sounds mysterious and, and uh, like you just hold your breath until you find out what it is you are going to tell about or talk about. Well, you know who used to do that? Uh, or used to play the character. Did, did you ever watch uh, uh, Johnny Carson years ago on the late night show? No, I was too late for me to stay up. <laughs> I'm an early to bedder. <laughs> well, he always used to play Karnak the Magnificent, and he had a turban on his head, and then he would do all of these uh, mystical readings, you know, and uh. it was uh, Karnak. And I always wondered, where in the world is Karnak? Now I know because... I was here. <laughs> and did you, when you were watching Johnny Carson, ever in your wildest imagination ever think that you would be there to see what he was talking about? Only through, only through Geographic magazine. Yeah. That's, National that's Geographic yeah. has been an education oh, to all of us, yeah. hasn't it? It really has. And uh, no, I, uh, to, to answer that, I never thought that I would be here. But I'll tell you, this is, this, it is magnificent. The magnificent yeah. Karnak or the, or the Temple of Karnak. Because these carvings, and, uh, and uh, as Betty and I were talking earlier, uh, the architecture here that you see, it, it's, it's really indescribable. Fortunately, I think our pictures turned out fairly well on this. And, you know, Betty, what surprised me is that after thousands of years, here those carvings are still in good condition. And later on in the show, we'll actually see that some of the original colors are, you know, when they, when they colored them in ancient Egypt, that they're still there. I mean, well, you can still see them. Is that color or is that, wasn't that like the adobe or the, the, the no. sand, that mew? No, you are watch those over, actually A little bit later on, we'll see some that are, that are up above, you know, uh, that have been protected from whatever the rain or windstorm. Yeah, stuff, or erosion. Uh -huh. And some of the, you can see the colors. And of course, later on, as we get into this series, uh, of uh, our Egyptian trip, we will go into some of the some of the tombs and some of the other areas, and uh, you'll be able to see that. However, I was not able to take the camera into actually into the the tombs when we get up to the Valley of the Kings. Uh, that just wasn't allowed. But in there, I do assure you that the the the, the coloration is still yeah. very very vivid now after take a thousands look at, of years. Take a look at the, what we're just looking at, the rounded one. You know, we you would think in like if for us if we were to see something like that now that it would be a silo. Do you think did they use that? Is that um, No, the, I think these were just storage. It was just a Well, they no, but you're right. They did they, there was a lot of storage because there was grain storage. Uh, but I think these particular things that we're looking at there were uh, some more of the uh, uh, of the pillars and you can see there's there's yeah. 10 of them uh, down in through that area we must also tell everybody that we're just looking at a small part of it here right. this temple area took acres and acres and acres I mean it wasn't just one little building that we were going into we we were there a good part of the morning or afternoon because uh, there was an so awful much, lot to see so much to see the thing Marv that still astounds me as I look at it is is in perspective to see how tiny we are compared to the the immensity of, of these mm -hmm. columns. They're so huge. They're so tall. And I say to myself, how in God's name did they ever get that top one on? You know, really? <laughs> well, we're going to find out in a little bit how some of the obelisks were actually raised. And, of course, they used their, uh, the natural building materials, which was the sand uh, that was there. And, of course, which is, which is all around this area. And we should mention that this is uh, in, the, in the town of Luxor, which is, uh, you know, quite a bit south of, uh, of uh, the capital of Cairo. And we were taking a, a cruise on the Nile River. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is where we actually joined the cruise. And we'll see more about that again in later episodes. But the, um, uh, the way that, that a lot of these were raised, and, and in fact, in this particular show, we'll see one of the obelisks that never did get raised is still lying there on its side, you know. Well, do you think it was it was from the earthquake that it's lying? I forget what the guide told us, but they I don't had, think they, they had I don't think that one ever got I don't think it was finished, ever finished. Huh? I don't think it because ever was raised they up. really were subject. A lot of this the, the damage that we see has been due to earthquakes. That's true. That's true. And you don't think of that particular area of the world 
thrilled, uh, you know, of having her. No, but you wouldn't want to be standing there if they nope. had one. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I thought? This is a crazy thought. When we went into the, the not this particular time, but we went into the uh, inside the pyramids, you know, and I thought, Oh my golly, if there was ever earthquake here, this would be the wrong place well, to be. I would tell you that would be your burial place. It sure would be. Yeah, what <laughs> For a eternity. Huh? <laughs> you and the pharaohs. Oh boy. But uh, you can see that the pharaohs certainly did construct some magnificent, magnificent uh, uh, things here. I mean, They sure had the do. big head, didn't they? They really thought they were something, that they were entitled to all of this what grandeur. Well, huh? they were the gods, weren't th they? Th yeah, they uh -huh. were. That's exactly. that's that was that was a belief uh, at that particular time. But see, Betty, now look there. You see a little bit, the little bit of the green color right there on the what would have probably been the dress of the. Uh, oh, that's a little moss that grew no. on. No, <laughs> you're not going to get any moss out there in 120 degree weather. Believe me, well, it cook off real fast. That's <laughs> all right. I I'll just do my own thing. I don't. You mean you think they actually? Used like the coloring oh, from yeah. the plants. These, to make these it, were huh? all these were highly colored. I mean, the whole area was they used a, a lot of beautiful colors uh, with that. And of course, you know, during time. Well, I knew a lot they did in the pictures. Off. I mean, all of the all of the. Uh, you mean in the tombs? Yeah, yeah, that you could see the the, right. the colors from that. But I don't know about. Betty, you were talking about how tall this was. Well, there yeah. there are windows that are up above here on a, on a, what would have been a second or or a third floor, as you can see. And now look under there. Now look real carefully here and you can see some of the rose colors uh -huh. and see they're just I mean they're they're very very mute but they are there but aren't those the hieroglyphics and that those are the that hieroglyphics and those are the ones that are colored I yes. expected uh -huh. them to be colored but yeah. I didn't think well, the, the, the rest external of this, would be yeah because the external is also hieroglyphics here too that you can see and well, this I'm is, not gonna argue with you because you're usually right anyway so it's not worth it <laughs> so. Ooh, okay I'll take that as a compliment that is a compliment oh yeah, thank you very yeah, much that's okay. anyway we are gonna listen uh, to our guide in just a moment because you can see that obelisk in the background and we want to find out now you said okay well how in the world did they ever get that thing up there and there were two great big huge obelisks that were here and uh in this particular area and we saw others as we went throughout uh, egypt as well and our guide will uh, explain just how these were you know erected so that they could get up into a standing position and uh it, it was amazing to me because i didn't know either but let's listen but the obelisk the only thing that must be one piece of granite. Rarely you see a column, a pillar, one piece, but the obelisk must be. And after cutting it in a small quarries, in one of those quarries, we will have a visit to one of them, bringing it here and putting it on its granite pedestal. They dragged it on a ram, before that they put a pedestal and four walls around it because they had to put sail. It is something like this. This is the grand pedestal and those are four walls. So as to put sand here in the top of the walls. It was a ramp here on which they placed it and they dragged it like this. You can imagine hundreds and hundreds men were ready to do so gradually it's here, and finally it's here, but they made another ramp on the other direction, it goes like this. So they kept pulling it till putting it here. So here the obelisk. What happened when they made holes in these walls and they removed the sand gradually? It goes down. So next it goes like this, next it be came like this, at the same time some tying the top of it, long, very strong ropes, and they were standing on the ramp here, trying to pull toward them, directing it. Anything built first decorated next, except for the obelisk. They had to carve on it, they had to decorate it when it was down. Hatshepsut had two obelisks, there were more inside and taken to Europe. That one, 320 tons, 93 feet or 28 meters high. Why we see two colors on it? Her nephew, her successor, King Thutmose III, who hated her, who killed her, who attacked everything she left. 
It chiseled out her names, her figures, her cartouches, so as to deprive her of the incarnation. So what did he do for the obelisk, which is heavy block, 320 tons? He built four walls around it to hide it. So we can see the top part, which was left facing the sun for many centuries, became different. That lady ruled 22 years when they discovered her tomb in the valley of the kings last century, because she was a ruler, not in the valley of the queens. Her tomb, they found no mummy, and also her names and her figures were attacked. The obelisk as a pointing finger to the moon and the sun. Both were gods. And the top refers to the top of Ra, the creator god, which was covered with, very top, was covered with electrum, gold and silver. We will see another one inside, dated back to the time of that queen. Both were put by her great engineer architect, one called Selmut. One fell down 27 BC because of an earthquake which shocked the whole area. Is that clear or no? Mm -hmm. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. So, we go next to see the temple of the 18th dynasty. 1500 BC, that way, and then we go inside. That really gets me, Betty. It just uh, That way, we'll go inside. We're just going to go back to 1500 BC. Mm. <laughs> well, I'm glad that we're doing it this way. I would, well, I'm sure would not like to have been living in that period of time. But I don't know why I say that, because every time, that every period of time had positives as well as oh, negatives, sure. yeah. huh? Well, you're right. You know, you mentioned earlier about the slaves and that, and you think... Golly, if I did live back in that time, I'd what, have been what, a slave. Would, I, would I have been a slave, or would I have been part of royalty, or would oh. I have been one of those people out there that was chipping away at those stones, you know, sure for I'd, the hieroglyphics? I'd, I'd have been one of the slaves that didn't last very long. They'd have put me out there in that hot sun, and that'd have been the end of me. You know, I just really wonder how long some of those people did last, because I, I mean, it's up to 120 degrees there in the sun. It got very hot very fast. Well, their life expectancy wasn't very much anyway, you know. I so. don't suppose so. Okay, well, here we are at 1500 B.C., but it's a little cooler indoors. That sister of Queen had ship suit, and the stone table should be here, on which the boat put, that was taken, as I said, once a year to not so Centuries went by. Alexander the Great invaded Egypt in 332 BC. He claimed that Amun was his father. He respected the Egyptian gods. Maybe that's why they didn't revolt against him. These men came to do something here in Cairo, and also they did another thing in Luxor Temple we see later. They removed the back wall. So look at its remains here. They built that second one also using granite, and they moved that stone table to be in the second one. Look at the ceiling here, higher than the second room. It's decorated with that starry sky. They decorated it with scenes to show the Pharaoh Alexander offering and praying for Amun for me because of fertility. But I'll show you beautiful scenes still with their colors behind this wall. So let's go to have a look at them, and it will be a good chance for our photographer. This way. Look at the top one to see the purification, the coronation of the king, and two are leading him to Amun. Amun blessing him finally. <coughs> and when you look at the second row, we see the priests of the temple carrying the boat and going to Luxor Temple. The boat of the god, as you see, begins and ends with the head of a ram. In its decoration, any sacred boat should begin and end with the head of an animal or a bird. If it is the boat of horse, it should be a head of a falcon, so the crocodile. So now we see ram's head and the priest carrying it on their way to the key. Look at the third row. They are coming back, so the direction of their faces back to Karma, to put it here inside. Next, I show you Alexander the Great, also as a pharaoh, before Amun, 
and after that we call the death of the king. To me, Betty, it's very amazing that, uh, that the people can read these hieroglyphics. And uh, later on in this series, we'll, we'll tell you exactly uh, who discovered uh, the, the key to that. And, uh, of course, we know it was with the, with the Rosetta Stone, if I remember correctly. But anyway, we're going to go further on down here. But, I, you know, it's so interesting because everywhere you look, I mean, there are hieroglyphics there. So the, there must be the, the history of the day was, was there. Oh, Betty, look now. Here, here's where we are. Now you can see a little bit more of the coloration. Now aren't you happy? Yeah. Now you've proved your point. Right. So I was wrong, and well, you were right. No, but no, no, then no, but I gave you, you credit anyway because okay. I told you you were probably right. Now what are we looking at right there? That's red. No, what's in the <laughs> middle of that, though? <laughs> uh, a scarab. A scarab, that's uh, right. That was, that was the dung beetle. And uh, the scarab was uh, figured very much into uh, some of the uh, older Egyptian uh, religions there. But look at the blue here. The blue is beautiful. I have uh, several scarab necklaces, uh, and they come in various shades. I have some that are green, and then I have one like turquoise, very, very brilliant. And they're all hand-carved, and they really are beautiful, and they were very sacred to did the you, Egyptians. Did you buy them in Egypt? Yes, sir. Oh, good. One, no, once I, one I, well, I bought one in Istanbul. Ah. Uh -huh. Okay. But well, that's it's close the same enough. Thing. I want you to look here because at one point in time, uh, during the early days of Christianity, this particular temple became a church. And we're going to see here uh, that, that part of the old decorations were, were taken away. And there's actually a, a painting and a carving in one of these columns of, uh, of one of the saints. And that was news to me. I didn't realize that uh, that, that had happened, but uh, uh, it, it evidently did. And, you know, it may have happened more than, more than one time, I mean, as, as Christianity took hold in this part of Egypt. And there it is right there, as you can see. Yeah. How about that? Of course, we, there's no identification, but you see little crosses and things. That if we imagine there is a hall of columns here, and they put this first row, a ram should be like this. When they put this one, they had to move the ram back to put the second row. They moved it back to put the third row. And when they put every one of them, they should connect the capitals. And you can say this is uh, <clears throat> the place where they want to put it a row of columns. It's a column here. On the top of each should be a square slab. Is that clear for you or no? Mm -hmm. So, they had to connect them, a piece here till the middle, going that way till the wall. So they left this half for the next piece to connect it with the second one till the next, the half as well. The next half to receive another piece till the half here and one more to connect it with the wall. Is that clear for you? That's fine. Look at that. Look at this row. And you can see here a wall should be. And then look at the first column. It's connected with the second, with the third, with the fourth, and the last one, number 10. Is that clear? Betty, we should explain that there's 134 columns uh, here at Karnak, and uh, to connect some of these, like, uh, like we see here, must have really been quite a feat. When they finished you know, putting them rows, row after row, they had to change the direction of the ramp. It was that direction. This time it should be this one. I mean, in each corridor should be a ramp. So maybe the beginning of the ramp here, it stopped me the first two capitals back there. And if I can have your two hands like this, it's a row of corridors here, and we want to make a roof. We bring stones like this and we put them one after one. When we put any piece, we have to put it till the half. Because we need this half for the next corridor. We need that half for the next corridor. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. So, thank you. So look at any one of them. So here, I mean this one, a piece of stone. Its half should be that side and the other side till the end because nothing after that. 
You know, Betty, without a guide, you, you actually get lost in this uh, temple at Karnak. And we should explain also, too, that Karnak is, is really, uh, or really was, I guess, during the time of the uh, what they call the New Kingdom of Egypt. This was uh, actually a suburb of Luxor, where there's also uh, another temple. And um, the, uh, the area was known as Thebes, which I think we're probably more familiar with. Yeah. The Greeks gave it that name, right? That was the old name for it, yeah. But you know, the amazing thing is, this was an exclusive territory. Yeah. This couldn't, no, the peons couldn't go here and worship. Well, maybe they could go occasionally and worship, but this was strictly built for the hierarchy that... Uh, they probably went in as cleaners. <laughs> <laughs> Swept well, up after well, the sand, sure sandstorm. They, I'm sure they could have done that. But it, it, to build such such a, a mon monumental uh, what am I edifice, and then have it be strictly for the elite? Just somehow doesn't seem right. Well, I think yeah, no, I think it was for the you know the various priests and priestesses yeah. that you had, and then of course uh, the the pharaohs and his royal family. Hey, this is interesting. Now this is an obelisk that we can see that didn't quite make it, did it? Well, you think at one time it was upright, and then the earthquake knocked it down, and they thought it maybe wasn't worth putting it up again. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not, I don't know. But uh, we can st still see that the Egyptians are still building here because there are some of the cranes and some of the uh, uh, reconstruction work yeah. that's going up. You know, it'll be interesting maybe in another hundred years to see what this is going to look like. Yeah, I don't think we'll be there to investigate it, though. Do you? Oh, really? Oh, I was kind of hoping. Other <laughs> years, <laughs> my gosh. You know, I thought it was rather interesting, though, that that one obelisk was lying down like that because it really gave us the opportunity to do a little more uh, 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 tuned uh, investigation of the type of hieroglyphics and, and uh, carvings that were on it. Yeah, you know, speaking about those two, uh, the hieroglyphics that we see, uh, these that were here in the in the temple at Karnak were finished by Ramses II, and they used what we call the sunken relief, so they were actually carved into the uh, into the stone itself. I was very happy, Marv, that we went when we did, and you know, we we did take this trip in May, which is a, sort of an off-season mm -hmm. time to go, but we, we were so fortunate. It wasn't really, really hot, and if you notice, we didn't have a lot of people around us shoving and pushing and trying to get in to see, you know. So many, many times it's advan advantageous to, well, most of the time I think it is to go when there's not a big crowd. Oh, that's true because yeah. you know, I'm, <laughs> you you go to this particular area uh, of Egypt, and there are going to be crowds, like you say, during all of the uh, the, the the summer months and uh, time when people have time off. But I just wanted to mention we we did talk about uh, about the Greeks who did call uh, this area Thebes, and that was that was a name that was already used by Homer. He spoke of Thebes of the hundred gates, uh, referring not too much to the city's gates, but to those impressive pillars that we've been seeing all the, all along. Well, Thebes was, was really known for their pictorial decorations, and I think that's where they got their first a, a big reputation, because look at, look at, look at what we're seeing, the, and, mm -hmm. and this was all over, everywhere. And, and, and this just didn't happen. I mean, this took thought and artisans and architects and... You know, you know it, it, that's true. And, and when you look and you see how much uh, that there is in the way of carvings here, there must have been hundreds and hundreds of, of artisans or carvers that were working on this for, you know, for just years and years. And you know like. what they used? What kind of tools they had? Not well, very I know much. That they were all hand tools. They were I would say hand that. tools and they had just a little hammer and then they had something like a chisel. And that they would hammer and ch well, I guess that <laughs> that's the way you do it in, in stone or marble mm -hmm. or whatever. Right. Probably today this is the way it's done, except they're, they're more sophisticated. Well, uh, it would have taken a long time, as we say, to do this. Betty, there's a shot of you coming up to where we see the, the dung beetle or the scarab again, which we've uh, seen, and we will see this in a lot of the hieroglyphics. Yeah. And, of course, this was... Uh, one of the, the statues that was actually done there. I have, I saw, as I've said before, I have several uh, necklaces and things with the sacred beetle on it. I was laughing at when I was walking, as we just saw me, the back side of me is all white. So I must have spent a few hours sitting, no, I don't know about hours, but I have spent, I should say, moments sitting on the side and resting myself, because, you know, so I got a lot of the sand off of wherever I was sitting. So I brought home souvenirs. Oh, the good. That is a land for me, not for me, yeah, from Egypt.
was here in Karnak, that he who is called Amon sat upon a hillock and thought the world into being during the floods of the month of July. This land of Upper Egypt, on which the most grandiose structure of the world rises, this land is said to have been the first to have risen from the primeval waters. It was upon this land where the swarms of wild duck alighted, the only land above the floodwaters, that men have built the city of God for the glory of his creation. time of its full splendor, this citadel could only be reached by a royal canal and a sacred avenue. The pharaoh, aboard his barge of glory, could moor here. Welcomed on the holy quayside, in the shade of the sycamores, by the pontiff and his numberless retinue of priests with their fellow fans. be overwhelmed by the sheer size of these ruins. The citadel that arose here was not designed on the scale of men, but on the grand scale of God, from whom all things flowed. The drought and the flood, the granaries and the plagues, dreams and power, death and survival. The great French archaeologist Jean Paulion who had awakened the cackling, twittering farmyard of the hieroglyphics rather in the manner of the sleeping beauty. When he came here, was amazed. Listen. All the pomp and magnificence of the pharaohs appears at Karnak. All the noblest and finest works of man. No other ancient people has conceived the art of architecture on so large, grandiose and sublime a scale as the ancient Egyptians. They thought in terms of men a hundred feet in stature. And if one of you this evening were to voice the question that you are whispering in your hearts, who art thou, Amon? The answer would seep from these walls, these lintels, these pedestals, these secret chambers, these piled ruins. For the answer is written everywhere in a thousand different hieroglyphics. I am the father of fathers, the mother of mothers, and the bull of the seven celestial kine. I open my mouth to speak in the midst of silence. I cause to be that men should have a path on which to trade. And we will see you next time on the Adventures Travel Club when we go back to... Karnak. <laughs> see you then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.